the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. movements need to move and they're like sharks they constantly need to move otherwise they choke and that means whoever comes to your organization or supporting your movement should be activated in a in no time so they need they they're there they come there to participate not to just be another number on your facebook page and the trick is to offer them something little that they can do so they feel uh, they feel good about it, but at the same time they don't end up in jail or they end up don't end up exhausting themselves. So the 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 lower the risk bar and lower the investment bar, the more likely are people to participate. The more people you get to participate, the more they are likely to affiliate for your organization in the long term because they're already invested. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers. And together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 44. Now, before I introduce my guest today, I want to give you a little bit of context. I think it's especially important for our younger audience who might not be familiar with Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic was the former president of Yugoslavia, and he was accused of being responsible for the war crimes and for genocide that occurred during the bloody Balkan Wars in the early 1990s. His case was held at the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague, and actually it was the first attempt to prosecute for war crimes since the end of the Second World War. Now, my guest today is Serja Popovic. He was born and raised in Belgrade, in Serbia, and he founded the student movement called Otpor, which means resistance, and the movement played a crucial role in overthrowing Slobodan Milosevic. Today, Serja is the executive director of CANVAS, which stands for the Center for Applied Nonviolent Strategies, quite a mouthful, uh, to teach people all over the world about how to be successful in creating movements that change societies and that write history. Now, I really wanted to interview Serja because the principles that he talks about are very, very relevant to creating change in organizations, especially, I think, involving culture. I would be very curious to learn what you found interesting in this episode. So let me know on Twitter at Coach Aga. And now, with no further ado, here is Serja Popovic. Serja, welcome to Culture Lab. Pleasure being here, Aga. Great to be with you. Great to have you. I'm so glad that you managed to find time um, between your travels around the world and join us. And I'm really curious to kick off in the same way we always kick off, which is ask you, what were the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person? Uh, well, basically, uh, in order to understand that, you need to travel a little bit in the past and probably in my case, uh, the 80s and the music of 80s and the culture of 80s was a key. I was born in 70s, so I was kind of a teenager in 80s, but the 80s culture was was very big in former Yugoslavia. It, was, it has a big punk and new wave scene and uh, that 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 was the time when i was trying to play a guitar in a in a rock band and things of that kind so so the music was very important and growing up to the rebellious music growing up to the music which was which was disrupting things and also having uh, my older brother being a kind of the serbian well yugoslav at the time pop star uh, playing in a big neo romantic band and then going with him on tours and and i was also exposed to all kind of different international music and and there was 
one moment which was particularly uh, important for me, and uh, uh, that was the moment when when uh, uh, there was a there was a huge Amnesty International tour in solidarity with South African anti-apartheid struggle, and then there was a large concert on Wembley, uh, uh, matched uh, Nelson Mandela's the leader of that struggle. 70th mm-hmm. birthday, who was jailed at the time, and there was this this uh, amazing song by an artist I loved at the time, and I, I'm still loving, and I, I met him later in my life, Pierre Gabriel, uh, about Stephen Biko, the South African mm-hmm. poet who was arrested and tortured to death. And this is where I figured out uh, that uh, not only the music can be the powerful vehicle to mobilize your emotions or to cope you with your emotions, it can be also a very powerful voice uh, for those who are deprived, because uh, without that song, probably uh, uh, nobody would hear uh, of Stephen Biko, or probably less people sure. would hear of Stephen Biko. And here we are on a big stage in an in internationally televised event, having some of the of the largest uh, rock and pop stars at the time, focusing on on a topic of apartheid. And this is the part of my of my maturing as an activist is figuring out that activism can can, can also be cool. So when mm-hmm. I was a, when I was a teenager, activist was a synonym for and old ladies fighting for dogs' rights. And that's not something you will jump in if you are, if you are a, a student. Uh, totally, no. And, but then later, throughout, the, throughout the, the end of 80s and specifically 90s, uh, through the things like, like Stephen Biko's song, through the things like Band-Aid, actually my, my brother participated in a, in a mm-hmm. Yugoslav super band connected to Band-Aid. And then later, through the, through the uh, culture of, of Yugoslav rock bands really opposing the war and being on the right side of the history and mobilizing right people uh, it was in part uh, rock culture and pop culture that that gave gave you the sense that if something is wrong in a society you have not only the right but also the moral duty to to rebel so i think the Mm -hmm. big part of of me becoming an activist was this curve where a i spotted musicians doing things b i was living in a really country which was falling apart and just to give it a little bit of the context i was born in a former yugoslavia uh, which was a decent middle class uh, one party system and uh, before i i was 23 uh, my country split four times. So without mm-hmm. changing a neighborhood I lived in, literally, I I, I lived for 40 years in, a, yeah. in the same municipality of Belgrade. Mm-hmm. I changed four passports. So I was wow. living in a social republic, uh, social federal republic of Yugoslavia, turn it into the federal republic of Yugoslavia with no socialist, uh, turn it into Serbian Montenegro and turning into Serbia after Mon- Montenegro seceded in a referendum in early 2000. So uh, for 40 years, I was living... 1,000 meters from the place I was born. And I was actually living in four different states. Uh, Economic-wise, I was born uh, in a in a in a middle middle-class family. Both of my parents were journalists. Uh, in 1993, when Serbia went through the economic breakdown and sanctions before because of the war in in Bosnia. Uh, I lived in a situation where my father needs to to sell smuggled petrol on the street to survive. Uh, Culturally, uh, being grown into the culture where, where Serbs and Croats and Bosnians and everybody else are brothers and sisters, uh, now you're 18 and you're conscripted to military and you are sent to war to kill a person because he or she is a Croat. So it culturally schizophrenic, economically uh, devastating, uh, historically really confusing. And when you're a young person, you have two choices. You either fight or you flee. And a lot of people fled, uh, including uh, my own brother. And they fled the conscription, they fled the hyperinflation, they fled the nationalism, they fled wars, they fled lack of perspective. But a large part of my generation stayed to fight. And I think it is the rock and roll stubbornness that gives us this idea. Is like, no, we are not expa- escaping, we are going to defend our own ground. Yeah, this is this is really an incredible story and I can relate to it because I come from Poland and actually I was born almost probably the same year that, that you are really close. So we've had our own story, not as dramatic definitely as Yugoslavia's story, but of course we were following really closely what was happening over there. Um, so I can definitely relate to what you have been going through. And, you know, what strikes me in what you have just shared with me is that absolutely, I think one of the things that was so important back then is to um, make activism attractive to young people. And I want us to talk a little bit more about that clearly today with you, because you were one of the founders eventually 
of the Serbian nonviolent resistant group, which was called Otpor. And you contributed, you and your colleagues contributed to the downfall of President Slobodan Milosevic in October 2000. Um, so I, I would like to ask you to give our listeners just a little bit of a context about the situation in Serbia and about Milosevic and why was it so important to take him down? Uh, well, basically, the, 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 there was this, uh, this large happy country called Yugoslavia till early 90s. And then the three strong nationalism brands, Milosevic in Serbia, Tuđman in Croatia and Izetbegovic in Bosnia, kind of torn it apart, uh, trying to beat the little kings in their own yards. And most of it was was turning into the, the nationalism and chauvinism, and which ended up in a stray of ugly civil wars. Uh, economically, it was a disaster for each unit uh, itself because the, the it was 20 million market turning into the small markets and then getting internationally isolated and then getting into sanctions. And of course, that killed economy completely. Uh, also, the, the, the culture changed from a, from a very a positive and kind of cosmopolitan thing into the very small inwards uh, looking uh, nationalist thing where the whole world is in conspiracy against you and so on and so forth. And uh, at the time, uh, the students were very loud and it started all in 1992 when the war broke out and there were mass demonstrations across the Serbian camp campuses at the time opposing war. And that was my freshman year on the university. So I was dragged straight from my freshman year into protesting and, and doing witty tactics and uh, singing peace songs uh, with Serbian rock stars in the campuses. And it was it was a kind of a, of a really early school of the things. And then 96, 97, uh, a Serbian government, which was at the time riding the international wave of Dayton Peace Court and kind of being restored as a negotiating part in an external policy. Politics. Uh, Milosevic lost local elections, and uh, he decided to he decided to to uh, cheat. And this was my first political engagement. I was running on a ballot for a progressive opposition parties. I was elected as a member of the of the city council at the age of 23, uh, which is kind of a pretty young age. And of course, my 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 my, my victory was annulled, as 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 more or less any other opposition victory throughout the countries. So now. We were a bit more mature at the time, uh, so we did a, a kind of a large uh, stray of protests across the country. We were we were coping with the Serbian opposition at the time. Uh, we were successful in bringing the international factor in. The OSC actually stepped in, and after three months of day by day demonstration, and that includes uh, 35 different cities and municipalities, uh, we really made Milosevic uh, make the concession and concede the original results, which is where we learned not only that the nonviolence struggle works if it's if it's well organized but we also learn the pattern that this guy is operating on uh, he will need elections to restore the legitimacy but he will start to meddle with elections uh, from the way they're structured to the way that he controls media and then if he loses he's going to manipulate and this was a very important learning curve for us because the moment when when Milosevic start meddling with the election was the moment that people who were not normally protesting step in the scene and that's a great uh, lesson for the things across the globe as well uh, movements become massive when the things become personal not too many people will protest for uh, for saving planet from a climate change or saving democracy because these goals look vague to a lot of people however if somebody steals your vote this is like stealing your wallet and this is where it becomes between you and the state. And this is where a lot of people from different walks of light comes in. So when we were structuring the movement, uh, resistance movement or OTPOR was made in 1998 by the group of students, veterans from, from students' protests, uh, we had all of these things uh, on the plate already. We knew that people can be mobilized if the things become personal. We knew that opposition is quite incapable to do things by themselves. We know Milosevic will cheat, so we need to prepare uh, to counter this this uh, cheating. Uh, we knew that the most important part of the society to, to get mobilized is youth, because youth traditionally, and I think this is very same and similar across the globe, the, the number of the wars between 18 and 25 are actually the lowest when it comes to the polls. And bringing more people from this 
particular age group to the polls was a key because this is where the large margin was created because these people hated Milosevic, but they hated politics. So it was their abstaining from the politics that actually was keeping Milosevic in power. And last but not least importance, we were aware that uh, uh, we, we can bring the people out if the opposition united, you, opposition can win, and then Milosevic will steal the elections because he did it in 96, 97. Unlike 96, 97, when we were demonstrating for three months, in 2000, when the Milosevic lost the presidential election, uh, we were prepared for a more blitzkrieg scenario. Large demonstrations across the country moved to tactics of non-cooperation in terms of general strike, and then bringing all of your forces to Belgrade to a decisive point, all within 10 days. So this time we were kind of prepared and we knew what needs to be done. And this time we were also also having a larger portion of, of international support and people watching the things and independent polling monitors and things of that kind. So we have a kind of stronger cards in our arms. Uh, Milosevic was also growing, growing, uh, uh, grow, growingly nervous and paranoid and did a lot of mistakes like arresting uh, 2.5 thousand people and releasing them over the course of a year for participating in nonviolent protests. And that was, of course, uh, sparking uh, more, more anger and more participation from the people. So this is basically uh, the learning curve of the thing. So we started by an activist that, you know, felt that somebody is taking their own country from there, uh, building from different different culture and, and, and different uh, historic backgrounds. We kind of built uh, several attempts to do this kind of stuff. Our first attempt, 1982, was looking very much like Occupy Wall Street. And which is why it failed. It wasn't spread to the to the places where the real uh, voters of Milosevic lived, which means outside of the urban and educational centers. Our second attempt, 96, 97, was mobilized around elections, and it involved involved the, the geographical dispersion, but it also involved the cooperation with the opposition and international community, and it also helped to learn these tactics. Because if you need to keep people busy for 100 days, you need to be creative. There's a lot of different things to do, except if they walk, 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 they will go home. Eventually, they will get 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 tired of, of walking and, and protesting. But if you give them the different tactic every day, they're more likely to participate. And then in strategy means, it also helped outline our strategy for 2000, build around the elections, unite the opposition, win on the elections, prove the victory and then wait uh, till uh, enough people get pissed off uh, with the fact that elections are stolen and have the network to, to capitalize on this uh, millions of people mobilization. And I heard you say in an interview that broadly there are two types of movements, spontaneous ones and successful ones. And I think from what you have just shared with me, it really does sound like um, you cannot just count on spontaneity when it comes to something like that. And you have underlined how important it is to be prepared to have a strategy, to use very tactics and, and really approach it almost as a project, right, that really needs to be managed very, very well. Um, so, so linking to what you have said, and also you've mentioned Occupy Wall Street, why, why do some movements, you think, that initially managed to gain a lot of support, like Occupy Wall Street, eventually fizzle out and fail to make a difference? Well, basically, uh, uh, since uh, 2000, uh, uh, after a short, a short romance uh, with being in the parliament, in the government, uh, I spent 15 years uh, researching into movements and working with nonviolent movements and meeting nonviolent movements of from all walks of life, uh, from typical anti-dictatorship uh, groups uh, in places like like uh, Zim or or Belarus or Egypt, all the way to the to the people like Occupy Wall Street, who are you know fighting for social justice or women's rights or 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 uh, environmental uh, uh, consciousness. Uh, movements are different. Uh, battlefields are different. Demands are different, but the principles are all the same. So when you take a look at what it takes to have a successful movement, uh, you really want to take a look and cut it down to the what we call the holy trinity of principle. 
One thing is vision and unity. You will never win by being anti-capitalist, anti-Trump, anti-this or anti-that. You need a vision that will bring people together and to hope to the people uh, to, to, to go on this uh, long marathon of social change uh, with you. You also need to figure out that uh, in that case, as you, you've been to Poland, you mentioned Poland, uh, you will need some unlikely allies to to work with and if you take a look at the at the at the serbia for example we need to unite 19 different parties from from far left to far right and that was not an easy job to do actually it was more complicated and at times more frustrating than fighting the dictatorial government because fucking fighting dictatorial government it's never boring so you do things, they do things, you, you mock them, they arrest you, uh, they go after you in the media, you go after them on the street, and, and this is the eternal uh, interesting thing. Uh, fighting the big egos of the people who can't see wider picture and are stick to their, to their identity politics and partisanship, which is not the, the unique in Serbia, it reflects the whole of the world, is where the real frustration comes on. Uh, similarly, when you talk Poland, Polish solidarity, which was one of the most important movements of, of, of 19th century, was actually the very unlikely coalition of the blue-collar workers uh, that started things in the shipyards in Dansk, low-educated, aiming for, for more labor organizing and not really getting very political till, till later. Urban intelligentsia in big Polish towns, which of course was pissed off the, the communism and understood the economic and political model, is not sustainable, uh, but they also gave kind of moral leadership and intellectual leadership and key documents and uh, the width of the actions and underground some is that uh, uh, publications and the roman catholic church so blue collar workers urban intelligentsia roman catholic church was the winning coalition against the communism in poland very similarly when you take a look at the contemporary movements and occupy is not uh, the exemption of it you need to talk to the people you disagree with so you need to work on recognizing constituencies you want to mobilize and then building the confidence in these constituencies, allowing them to come with their grievances into your own manifesto and vision of tomorrow, because you will need these people along the way. So unity and vision is, is a thing, number one. Planning, as you mentioned, is a thing. Number two, whether you're planning a, a large strategy, which means, you know, if there is one button I need to press, what is this? The government, the parliament, the, the law, where, I, where this change will happen. And then building the shortest causal chain between you and that victory. And, and that also means tactical planning. And tactics are, are probably uh, the most uh, uh, interesting part, at least the, the sexiest part of the movements. And when you take a look at, at, for example, Occupy Wall Street that named themselves after a very divisive tactic, because obviously I can agree on, on uh, whatever their goals are, but as somebody who travels a lot and ha has a two kids, I just don't have time to participate in the occupation. So you need uh, tactical thinking on how you spread your appeal across the globe. What are the, the what, what we call the lower, you need to lower the tactical entry bar. So the more tactics you give to the people, that are less invested into it, the more the people were likely to participate. And that means, you know, wearing badges, doing things on their profiles, signing petitions. So you need to think uh, across the, the spectrum of the people who can participate. And you also want to think about the targeting and how your tactics are impacting uh, your opponent. And if you want to, to target a bank, for example, which is a big deal with, with Occupy, the last thing you want to do is the camp in the park in front of the bank because it's not disrupting bank. And if you only persuade enough people to pull their accounts from the bank, that's a completely different thing because the banks respond to lose of money. And then they may think of, you know, or, or changing their policy towards forced evictions if this is what you want to achieve. But when you look tactically at the things, it is, it is very naive to start with the tactic, to continue with the tactic, to name the movement after the tactic, and then, and then, and then stick with a tactic that, that, that doesn't produce results, thinking that the next time it will produce results. So when you look at the contemporary movements, they're, they're very keen on understanding not only how to shift tactics, but also what is the grand strategy. So when you look at the, at the growing environmental movement at the moment, where you look at the more appealing part of the Greta Thunberg and high schools protesting in a, in a, 
in uh, Fridays, which gives a big of the kind of the appeal from the teenagers to the older generation of the people like you and me that really screwed up. Uh, do you want to, to shame these people to learn them in a movement? Or do you want to look at the more hands-on, bold, disruptive tactics like the very interesting movement named Extinction Rebellion recently did in UK, uh, disrobing themselves in the middle of the parliament session and super gluing their butts uh, to, the, to the window so the parliamentarians can see it, and then going uh, on the occupation of the main, of the main uh, bridges in London with more than 1,000 people arrested, and then successfully putting the climate change on the top of the, of the parliamentary agenda. So whether you look at the, at the more subtle tactics, whether you look at the more extreme and radical tactics, uh, the question is, is this all part of the plan? And, and as Sun Tzu says, you know, the strategy without tactics is just the wishful thinking. So the tactics without strategy is just the noise before the defeat. And this is exactly what, what the book is telling you about. And this is exactly what the successful groups know. That they need a strategic and tactical planning. Aside of just unity and planning, the third large, large uh, and very important principle is nonviolent discipline. Not only that the nonviolent movements are more ethical than the violent movements with no doubt, uh, but also they are twice more likely to succeed. And when you take a look at the serious historic studies, you will figure out that you have twice more chances to succeed in social change if you are using nonviolent movement than if you use some combination of violence and nonviolence. Why, why do you think that is, Sergio? What's the reason that nonviolent tactics are so more, much more effective than a combination of violent ones? Well, there is a great study by two American scholars named Why Civil Resistance Work. And uh, it looks actually in the algorithm of the, of the uh, there is a relationship between the participation and success. And I think uh, this is the key relationship in the social change. So the more people participate in the campaign, the more likely they are to achieve the change. The more par people participate in the campaign, the more likely that the change would be durable. And the more people, uh, more people uh, participate uh, in the campaign uh, from a diverse walk supply, the more likely is campaign to be successful. So when you take a look at these findings, uh, this is the very answer to the question. So if we are organizing a really cool march where people are 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 uh, uh, banging drums and and singing loud music and and doing funny things and and you know your daughter can participate your your mother can participate your grandmother can participate so the level of participation in in cleverly suit nonviolent protests exceed the level of participation of a march of a, a young angry people that will start throwing molotovs because if you think that there will be a tear gas you may not bring your kid or dog. So, so when you start looking by a blunt thing that the nonviolence is far more likely to end up in a wide participation, and then you take a look at the results, the more people participate in defending the vote, the more likely you'll get the free and fair elections after that. Not because the new government is particularly uh, better than the old one, but because they know there is a price tag in messing with people's vote. Uh, so be through being part of social change, the people kind of become the shareholders. And that's very interesting, interesting view. The more time you invest, the more energy you invest, the, the even specifically if you get if you get tear gassed or you're you're participating in some kind of drama, the, the more emotionally invested, the more you're likely to see it as your own investment and, and, and as the as the company that you're a shareholder from, as opposed to oh, this is politician, I'm going to vote for him or her, and then you know for four years I'm not going to think about it. So this is where you invest your, your thing, and this is where you invest the time that you can spend with your family or earning money. And very often, this is the time you invest your, you invest your own money. I mean, all of the startups, like the movements and startups are very similar. They all start by, by addressing to the, to the friends, fools, and family. And this is where your own friends, your own fools, and your own family are investing their thing. And the more you invest, the more you're likely to be the shareholder. The more you're likely share to be a shareholder, the less it is likely that the change will be reversed because there are so mm -hmm. many shareholders. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That makes total sense to me. So you have this holy trinity of change. I'm wondering, how did that come to you? Was this a result of your experiences as part of Otpor and then your activities as Canvas? And by the way, for the listeners, Canvas is the organization you are leading at the moment, which is the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies. Um, and it's working with 
now I think more than 46 different countries from Zimbabwe to Rand, Venezuela and so on. And what you are doing is spreading the knowledge of the nonviolent strategies and tactics, right? Um, so, so yeah, so how did you come up with that? Was this a result of sort of analyzing what happened, what strategies you used with Otpor? Or t- walk, walk me through your process of learning and then distilling this learning so that you can share it with others. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the learning curve started early and Serbs are bad in reading books. And they like to, they're more like kids. So we, 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 we do it by the trying it and failing. And I think the, the part of the knowledge and learning curve came from, especially the unity part, came from our very bad experience with Serbian opposition and how we were incapable to make them do things along the students. And then even in 96, 97, when we were marching for 100 days and then they gained the power in, in cities and, and municipalities and then they miserably split after the, the several months. So the unity part was was kind of, of understanding uh, it from the from the from our own mistakes. And later we figure out that there are unity things in different struggles as well. And sometimes it's, it's ethnic unity sometimes it's religious unity it's not necessarily only political unity and uh, and uh, and the second second thing is like planning is like serbs don't know how to plan but we read some manuals and if you're planning in serbia that makes you ultimately superior and then the non-violence part was was uh, in serbia it was playing it by the ear in terms that the violence was so no go zone and not cool after all of the civic wars so we just wanted to be different than the loud people in power who were advocating violence for so many years but then start working with the different groups across the world especially where we have this elements of the very violent culture and very violent history and and this is where you need to give it more preparation and more training and more focus and turning it into ideology of the movement and things of that kind so part of this was a learning curve uh, we are doing it. We're making mistake, and then we are we are learning from our mistakes in '90s. The part of this was reading books, and specifically Gene Sharp's From Dictatorship to Democracy was a big eye opener in terms of strategic uh, thinking. And then the part of it was was studying cases from the past. Uh, by virtue of being grown in in uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, you would learn a lot about anti-colonial struggles. You would be studying Gandhi in your secondary school as a, as an international phenomenon. So the part of it that we were blessed by the education in a, in a way that we were living in a, in a non-aligned country. So Indians were our best friends, even if we were geographically very far away. But uh, And also, last but not least importance, every time you meet a new group, you learn. It's a, it's a, it's a, the reason I love my my job as a as a kind of, of educator or consultant to the nonviolent movements is that every new movement comes in with a new problems, new ways to fix problems, uh, new new ideas on how to do things uh, in their own specific ways. Not of, all of these ideas are great, but a lot of these idea gives you food for thought because there is no such thing as universal blueprint for social change. Even if I name my book after one. Uh, the, there is a there is a general blueprint on what you need to do if you want to be effective, but then you need to study cases, and these cases are are never never stopping to to. I mean, uh, I'm, I do this thing a lot, and in a world of tactics, we are looking into something which is called dilemma action, and especially in a world of activism, it's like how you make non cool things cool. So one of my favorite favorite uh, topics is very non political, is very universal. It can work in a in a in a very authoritarian place. It can work in a in a functional democracy. It's a problem of the potholes. So if you are only studying potholes and the way the people are are addressing their local governments to fix the potholes, there is at least four different examples in the last five years on very creative approach to this. And I'm telling this intentionally because people never think, never con- would never connect creativity with a pothole. So absolutely, yeah. What they what what they are doing now, for example, if you take a look at the, at Serbia or Zimbabwe or at least five different places I know, is because these potholes are really ugly and and nobody takes care of them and you know people will do the petition and this and that, but the city government wouldn't give a damn for it. So they start planting flowers. In Zimbabwe, they're even planting trees. Uh, 
Now you're driving your car and instead of hitting the pothole, you're seeing the tree. A, you defend your car from hitting a pothole. B, you just seen something very unusual on a, on a, on a highway, so you're going to tell it to the friend. Uh, C, it becomes a topic. And D, it becomes a dilemma for the government. So will they let these trees happily setting their roots inside the pothole or then going to do the goddamn thing that they are paid for from our taxpayers' money? Uh, the second part of it is like... Uh, you can do it in the RT way. So 2000, 2016, there was a large campaign in Ekaterinburg, uh, Russia, where the government and mayor both promised that, you know, we'll rid, get rid of these potholes due to the whatever date. And of course, when date passed go, they hired the local artist to really paint the face of a governor and the face <laughs> of a mayor as around the pothole. So it's like the pothole mm. is the mouth and the rest is the face. And that also personalizes your curse because when you hit a car with, right. a, with a hit a pothole, you curse. And now you have a person to curse. And, and, and that's the very person who should be fixing the pothole. Well, crazy mm -hmm. as it is in Russia, the police, uh, well, the government came in and they didn't fix the pothole, but they, they cleaned the graffiti. So the pothole stayed. <laughs> so they looked even more stupid so than the really component. Work. Yes. And then in Panama yeah. City, which is a very, very uh, fast development thing in terms of big buildings, but nobody takes care about the potholes. So the people hired the, the, the people, people hired the marketing agency and they come up with a technological solution of a small object which looks like a rubber hockey pack and it gets in mm -hmm. the pothole and when you hit it with a car it tweets it tweets ouch to the mayor's, mayor's account <laughs> and saying i'm a pothole number 123 i'm in a corner oh, of the street a and street b <laughs> and i just heard the car of, of this beautiful lady fix me fix me fix oh, me so brilliant. and there is an automated tweet which goes straight to the mayor account every time the, the, the object uh -huh. is hit. And then last week, I was talking to some of my friends from Bolivia, and they just sent me an amazing uh, Facebook post where there was an action to fix a pothole a year ago, and now because the government did nothing, they just celebrated the birthday of the pothole. <laughs> like they did a real party with a little cake and journalists and, and everything. Right, so right. You can see how, how creativity can make you yeah. think about the very, very down-to-earth things. And you also can mm -hmm. see how it can grab attention with not too much of the investments and not too much of the risks. And the reason why I'm telling you this very long story is because it's ongoing thing. So the people are coming for creative solutions for di different situations every day. And every time you speak to them, you learn something new. So it's not like you have a blueprint, you go there, you teach them how to build a building and that's it. Then they build it and then, then you go to another building. It's a very interesting mutual process in which you kind of come in with a toolbox of training people how to build social change, but you're so very open to their own mentality and their own creativity. And then you're also using the creativity approach from one country to, as a case study to inspire people from another country. And it's, it's, a, it's a great job. It can be exhausting yeah, yeah, and I crazy at the times, but it's a great job. Yeah, yeah, I, lo I love that. And you talk in your book as well, uh, you're considered to be one of the one of the fathers of loftivism, la right, which is the use of humor, basically, to take down dictators and bring about social change. So I'm curious, what, why do you think this this tactic is so effective in bringing about change, just using humor um, to address some issues that perhaps were taboo or very risky to talk about? Well, basically, the loftivism is a happy combination of uh, humor and wit, uh, with or political satire, if, if you want it, uh, with something we call dilemma action. So uh, every society has its own political satire, but the political satire per se is not activism. So these are two different things. Uh, when you when you are looking at the situation in which, for example, the pothole thing, which I just explained, uh, you when you want to build your tactic, uh, the best way to build it if you're creative enough or if there is uh, enough space to do it, is about the dilemma. You want to put your opponent in a dilemma. You want to put him or her between the rock and a hard place. If they react, they will look stupid. If they don't react, they will look weak. And it, it builds back to the Gandhi salt march, which was the first documented dilemma action, uh, at least in my, in, my, in my little world of nonviolent theory. And Gandhi came to the idea that he should pick an issue that pisses people off. And that was the Brits, the colonial British government was 
taxing the salt in India. And the fact that India has uh, around 5,000 uh, 5, uh, miles of the line of the seacoast, so anybody can produce salt without being taxed. And he says, I'm going to be the first guy who's going to produce salt. I'm going to break this ban. And, and if I do this effectively, the Indians will start uh, producing salt on themselves. And it's going to be the economic blow and also reputational blow. You can't govern us to the, to the British uh, uh, viceroy. And then if they arrest me, I will walk out as a hero with a fine of, of 200 bucks and I will be the, the national leader of the movement. So he started this walk from Dundee, walked with, with 60 people, which grew up to 20,000 until the time he got to the sea. He was very media savvy. He did that this publicly. The Brits were under great dilemma. They arrested him and then he walked out and become a hero. But basically this type of thinking is what leads you to the loftivism. Another layer of it is how to make it witty. And, you know, in Serbia, we were playing by the ear. So we came out with this idea that maybe because people hate president, if we put the face of the president on a petrol barrel associated with a bat and put a little pinball type of hole in the top so you can just buy, uh, buy your right to express your love to the president with, with few times hitting this kind of thing. And of course, it rings aloud and the people are hitting this barrel and the kids are kicking the barrel. And now you have a clue of the people, probably 50 of them lining up to do this. And then the police arrive. So what would you do if you are the police? Uh, Arrest the people who are downtown shoppers who just found the barrel and take them to the police station and charge them with what? Uh, arrest the people who came out with this prank. We are nowhere to be seen. We disappeared from the scene. And then, of course, they did the most stupid thing. They arrested the barrel. <laughs> So now here you are, this very powerful yeah. police, which is the, the, the helm of the Milosevic suppression to the people, and you're turning them into punchline. Yes. That and, part uh, of the performance, it's almost like yeah, theater, they, be, they right? belong to yeah. the theater. Yes, they're mm -hmm. the part of the theater. So we count that they will come in. We count that they will do something stupid. We count that they will do something stupid in front of the cameras. And then you build the rest of the prank mm -hmm. on it. So basically, there are three, three reasons why humor is a very powerful mobilizer in social change movements. Uh, first thing, humor breaks fear. Uh, if you are preparing for, and fear is a, is a key. Like when you take a look at the main status quo tool in authoritarian regime, it's the fear. People are afraid of doing things because bad things will come to there. If you take a look at the US or UK or EU society, it's apathy. So these are the very different drivers of status quo. But humor kind of kills fear and breaks apathy. I'll give you two examples. Example on fear. If you're preparing for a major surgery, the last thing you want to know is, you know, I'm your surgeon. I'm going to open your chest and I'm going to put this beautiful yeah. metal all, object all inside you. Details. You're like, no, 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 I don't need to know <laughs> that. I don't need to know that. Just give yeah. me the anesthetics and goodbye. Right. Wake me up when it's done. Mm -hmm. Whether if your best friend comes in and she or he struck, strikes a joke, yeah. you start laughing and it's in our human, like the, the fear disappears. Yes. Uh, same with the apathy. Uh, uh, how many boring parties uh, have you been to that you wanted to walk out? And then somebody who is really witty and really cool and a king or queen of humor appears in and it just turns into the place you want to stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second reason why humor is powerful mobilizer, aside of just breaking fear and apathy, the humor is cool. Yeah. Think about, and the cool people, uh, cool, cool movements attract people. So think about the, take a look at your phone and say, okay, who's the most interesting person to be around? Yeah. And is it the richest person, the most beautiful person, the best educated person, or the person who can always make you laugh? Yeah, so true. People tend to to hang out around the people uh, who can make you laugh mm -hmm. and people tend to to hang out around the situations that can end up in something that causes laughter and this is our human nature so both psychological reasons have nothing to do with political science they're actually more into the world of psychology the third one however is the one i explained if you challenge people in power they are pretty unfit to deal with it people in power Tend, uh, tend to take themselves too seriously. They spend too much time listening to their own speeches, watching their face in the newspapers, billboards, TV. So they start believing this fake image of themselves being big and, and bigger than, than everything else. And the moment you, you grab them by the, by, the, by the joke, the moment you grab them by the wit, the moment you put them between the rock and the hard place, what they will do? Very likely they will do something that will make them look stupid. Totally.
Yeah, I love that. This is so fascinating. And actually, you know, I've been researching organizational culture for years. And one one of the conclusions that I've arrived at, and of course, not not just myself, but many other people who um, are interested in this subject, is that absolutely fear really breeds very toxic cultures and apathy as well. And mm-hmm. it's so interesting that, as you say, you can help people overcome fear, not not just by doing things that are very serious to create psychological safety, but actually, as you say, by using humor and play. And I think there's a huge potential still in companies, in organizations to use those two tactics of, of humor and, and creating psychological safety for people to uh, create better cultures. And I agree of, with you. Yeah. I agree with you. People also tend to do things better if they feel good. Yeah, And that's probably reflects the culture in the organizations as well. Yeah. So if they're really into something, they're more likely to give best of themselves yeah. in terms mm-hmm. of creativity mm-hmm. and investment, as opposed to they're just doing their jobs. Yeah. And when you're doing something unusual, like getting ready to mock the, the president of the country, that's something that gives you, gives you mm-hmm. thrill. Yeah, totally. So, so. The, the vision, the purpose um, is definitely very, very important, uh, but also that element of play and of, of it being perceived as something cool and interesting and worth sharing with other people is definitely also really important. And I'm thinking how all of this incredible, you know, wisdom and knowledge um, from studying movements and driving movements could be applied to organizations and companies. And I know that you are the executive director of Canvas. So you are leading actually a team of people, right? And probably I'm guessing that you are like any other organization. Um, and you, you must have thought um, throughout the years, um, something along the lines you know, we need to change the way we do things around here, or maybe even our culture feels a little bit off at the moment. Um, so knowing what you do about social change, uh, I, I'd like to reveal, if you can, how do you go about shaping a healthy organizational culture in Canvas? Uh, I'm very poor at it. <laughs> I'm, I'm an awful manager. I, I, I'm, I'm inaccountable for many stuff. I, I'm all over the place. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm a very bad example in terms of, of how I do things because, because it's like a, but it's very suitable for a five people operation. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think, I think this type of, of uh, mission driven work with complete focus on how you impact people and really trying to have people on the ground, uh, as opposed to the to the idea of oh we will need to grow the operation we need more bureaucracy we need more grants I'm very bad at that so in terms of growth I'm not good for growth in terms of managing the organization which is very uh, 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 narrow in in what we do we never met the organization that does what we do in terms of we are delivering one specific group of the people one specific uh, set of skills and we are we want to be the top number one in the world of this and we are not getting into into other things i think it's very cool but basically what we learn from from building movements and growing movements uh, there are two things which can be which can be applied to the different non-movement organization or even some some parts of the of the of the of the business uh, first thing is like the people power movements are 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 have need to put people in the middle of their 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 uh, uh, their scheme it's it's the people that when you take a look at the theory of change and when you take a look at the at it of a chessboard uh, the only the only figure that can turn into any other figure is the people uh, the people come with their leadership the people come with their connections which means they are the source of the new people uh, the people come the people come uh, with a, with a skill set so if you if you need somebody to build your website or do the social media campaign you relate to your own uh, people the people come with a, with a, with the material resources somebody will have a car and drive you from place a uh, to place b the people also bring authority because more people means you're more more uh, likely to look serious uh, towards the others so whatever part of need uh, in the nonviolent social change you touch it is coming from the people so what we what we learned in in Otpor and then later in canvas in all this movement is investing into people is the key so training people in how to 
do more effective tactics, how to do more effective brainstormings, how to do more effective logistics. It's like basically investing into your human capital is what the movements like that distincts uh, successful movements from unsuccessful movements. And I assume that's the rule number one that you can apply directly from the movements to the non-movement organizations because uh, it is very blunt in movement. The the like when you're when you're opposing the the government and when you take a look at the battlefield, mm -hmm. they will always have bigger budget. Then. Right, of course, yeah. Because they have taxpayers' money, uh, they will always have uh, they will always have the 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 sanctions on their side because by law. The police and, and judiciary and the military are, 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 you know, by the law, you need to obey them. And then the, they will also have a larger reputation because they are there for centuries and your movement is there for six months. And they have all of the symbols of the state authority, you know, so the buildings, the parliament, the government, the flag, the hymn, the, the currency. And it's like they already have all of these things that you need to build. The only way you can, uh, you can outmaneuver them is if you bring enough people in the mix. And very often I, I, I compare this to the playing, uh, playing a basketball against the NBA team, which is very popular when explaining it to the US people because every NBA team has a, sur uh, has a person whose surname is It, <laughs> which means that person is coming from Balkans. Right, right, correct. Jokic very Popovic, good basketball. you know these guys? Course, yes. Of course. Yeah, so we are we are so 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 what happens is when you need to play against against Denver Broncos and they had this amazing team of professionals paid billions of dollars and and of course it's five of us and we will be defeated to our to our to our uh, knees but what about bringing 20,000 spectators to play for you? Hmm. So do you mean by that? So the only way to win, yeah, you you mean by 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 getting these people who are watching the mm -hmm. game and having their popcorn and beer. Yeah to get on and play. So you turn the people around who are sitting on the fence into the active participants of your movement. And by that, you're winning through numbers. So still one-on-one, -on -one, you will never win against Jokic because he's an all-star player and you are, you are nobody. But if there is 50 of you and one Jokic, that doesn't really help. Uh, so, so for him, it doesn't really help. His skills, like he will never get that ball. Like it will never get to him. So basically building numbers and investing in numbers and investing in skills of your people is the one thing that, that I'm applying throughout all my life. The second is very interesting part. What movements see the waves of the org mobilization, but they very rarely follow it with the organization. And I think this is the main trap of contemporary movements. You want to take a look at anything, like the Women's March at the day of inauguration of, of President Trump. You had millions of people on the street, but there was nobody going there and recruiting these people for a long-term movement. So you have these large waves of mobilization, but if you don't cope it with the organization, it sinks. Because the nature of a mobilization is that you mobilize, blah, 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 and then you go do something else. So recruiting and training people in these large waves of mobilization and then turning it into the grassroots organization and then using this grassroots organization to build more and more tactics of mobilization till you get to the next peak and then recruiting more on the next peak means, means that your movement is moving like the shark. It's moving forward, it's growing constantly, the peop there are more and more people, the people feel confident, the numbers are growing, you're investing into skills and knowledge. So very similar to that, you want to take a look at different organizations or companies recruiting and investing into your new people is is a paramount for movements and you can apply this to any kind of culture you yeah want to totally build. and i think that if you want to change a status quo in an organization and and if it's cultural change then i really truly believe of course you cannot mandate it from the top even if the ceo is on board and that they he or she wants to bring about this change i think that without having as you say people who are connected and believe in this and then bringing in their colleagues and colleagues from other teams and so on this would never work and it's interesting to explore you know what sort of architecture or support systems organizations need to build around these networks of people so that, as you say, you can maintain that momentum. Because I, you know, working with organizations, what I see is that indeed you, you build that momentum initially, but then it fizzles out. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot to be said about how do you, how do you maintain that, right? 
Yeah, there are several. Also, there are several. Understand, like like when you take a look at the movements, movements need to move, and they're like sharks. They constantly need to move, otherwise they choke. And that means whoever comes to your organization or supporting your movement should be activated in a, in no time. So they need. They they're there they come there to participate, not to just be another number on your Facebook page. And the trick is to offer them something little that they can do. I love that, yeah. So they feel uh, they feel good about it, but in the same time they don't end up in jail or yeah. they end up don't yeah, end yeah. up exhausting themselves. So the 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 lower the risk bar and lower the investment bar, the more likely are people to participate. The more people you get to participate, the more they're likely to affiliate for your organization in the long term mm-hmm. because they're already invested. That's right, exactly. And you gave this example in your book and in, in um, some of your talks that I saw about the stickers, for example, right? That's such an easy thing to do. Um, you give people stickers with people a stickers logo, basically, meeting. right, of a clench fist, which was the which was the symbol of Otpur. And it was so easy to stick it anywhere. You can't get arrested for that. No one will see it. And then you fill the space with a with symbol of uh, the movement. So people start. With yeah, but you also, also, also made that person who came for the first meeting uh, feeling useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. thinking about how people can be useful. For example, we had a whole branch of the retired people who couldn't go on the demonstrations, who couldn't get arrested. But when somebody gets arrested, you will you will give the phone number of the police station to the 30 retired people who want to help. And they have a lot of time on their hands and they can constantly call police stations and buzz them about, you know, what's about this lovely girl? She's arrested for no reason. When you're going to arrest her, wouldn't you be rather chasing drug dealers and so on and so forth? So there is somebody who is 75 sitting at home. She or he can't go to demonstration, but now she's a very useful uh, she's a very useful part of the movement and she can get very passionate about it and she will tell it to her friends and maybe they will join. And now I'm sure that if somebody gets arrested, I will I will make the police yeah. station uh, stay hell mm-hmm. because there will be 100 retired people constantly buzzing <laughs> yeah. them, constantly buzzing them. Con- yeah. And they can be very persistent. So it's like, A, you give people something to do so they feel meaningful. B, it contributes to the firepower of your movement, if you want to name it that way. And C, you grow the family of the youth movement into a very unexpected uh, territory of the retired people. Yeah, 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 absolutely. This is so fascinating. And one of the things that you say, and particularly in the last chapter of your book, is that every creature can change the world. I think this is also a really good illustration that you don't need a specific profile of activists or change makers in companies. And it's wise, as you say, to embrace that diversity because everyone can and should be able to contribute and feel useful. I think it it really is such an important message um, because for a lot of people in organizations that um, I came uh, in contact with, they will say, well, what can I do? But actually, if you can show them what they can do, then then they would be more often than not more than willing to contribute and do something. It's just that they can't see perhaps sometimes um, what that something um, could be. And so speaking of diversity and bringing people with different profiles on board, uh, do you have any advice to leaders who try to create diverse groups of people that would work in in the same direction? Because it can be challenging sometimes. It is challenging. Basically, my 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 inspiration for this comes from from what I consider my personal Bible, which is the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and and for your listeners, this is this uh, fantasy story, also a very good movie, mm. where the most unlikely creatures in the world, hobbits, yeah. uh, are actually tailored uh, to be the the most important part of the struggle against evil. And they are not tall. They are not strong. They don't have armors. They don't know magic. Uh, but because they're capable of building the fellowships and, and going on a journey and because they're committed and because they're people like us, they're actually those who, who, who win the day at the end of the, of the film and the book. And being very much inspired and considering myself a hobbit uh, from, from, the, from the very beginning of my, of, my, of my life, and you should have seen me. I'm, I'm neither strong or super tall or super handsome. I have seen you. So the, yeah, but I'm 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 not I'm not looking like Aragorn the warrior. <laughs> no, not you're all. not. Yeah. And I and I have two left legs, so I can play <laughs> football. 
but basically the 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 thing is like uh, the the when you take a look at how you build these teams you first of all need to figure out that you need diversity and the part of it is is going for this diversity and then the second thing is that that uh, uh, at the very beginning of the story i think the thing is like uh, we need to agree what we are going to agree upon what is our smallest common denominator okay we go to 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 mordor and we destroy the ring and then sauron is not there and then we are back to our normal lives whatever our normal life are and then and then you also need to agree on what you disagree and i think this is where the groups make mistakes because they they handily align themselves with the with the allies sometimes very 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 diverse allies but then the things which are hitting them are popping up throughout the process and then they are killing the process and uh, the part of this we we could see in the contemporary movements which were you know very strong wise until there is a question of religion until there is a question of abortion until there is something which immediately splits the movement in half and i think uh, the the beginning is understanding that you're hobbits and you also need wizards and you also need people who can do press and you can only need need people who can recruit and you also need people who can fundraise and these are not normally your folks there can be very different folks than your folks whatever you consider your folks in your in your little echo chamber offline and online and you need to reach to these folks and they will be different than you and the first thing is uh, getting on page with what you agree upon but also discussing these things that you disagree upon and i'm always referring to the to the serbian case was like 19 different parties from far right like the groups that were advocating the religious education in schools to the groups that were advocating gay rights in a very very conservative country so in serbia the gay rights are unfortunately still considered to be very liberal uh, and uh, and uh, but you sit with these people and you tell them okay can we just get to the point where we win free and fair elections because without free and fair elections, uh, why it matters uh, whether you stand for A and, and this guy stands for B, because it will neither A and B won't happen, because somebody will always steal elections, you'll never be in a parliament. So can we please, just please, uh, uh, delay a, a, a gay rights versus religious education topic from the table? There will be time to discuss this, but to get to this time, we first get need to get rid of this guy who is who is stealing elections and controlling tv and and not allowing you to come in yeah. and he's controlling the narrative mm -hmm. so who gives care? nobody knows what you stand for totally and so it's always trying to bring it back towards our common goal and our common vision our shared vision right and focusing people on that and finding that common denominator and i think one of the really nice examples that um you used to illustrate that in the book is harvey milk's story right and he was mm -hmm. an activist for gay rights and and he was really trying to drive that agenda but then he realizes in the course of his career that actually he needs to start listening more and what people really care about what's important for the constituency and and for people who would be voting and it was dog poo wasn't it it was a dog's poop. Yeah. Yes, this is generally the, 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 this, first of all, it's like rather than listening to the podcast or reading books, people should watch Milk because yeah. it's a, so, aside of being a great um, blockbuster, it's, it's a very educational mm -hmm. movie. And plus the, plus the, 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 the champagne is amazing. amazing yeah. it. And uh, the, the way it started, it's like a very interesting thing that people need to learn more from their own history. And the history of, of the first openly gay person elected for San Francisco Council, namely the photograph shop owner, Harvey Milk, who had no political experience and was Hobbit, if, if there was ever one. Uh, he was the one jumping in battle, very passionate about the, the gay rights. And he was typical soapbox preaching type of, of activist, persuading you that this is the most important topic in the world. But through this, he wasn't capable to 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 win uh, anything but his very strong uh, uh, gay rights base, and that was not something that would get him elected. So he started experimenting with things and being open to the new things is great. He hired a woman uh, to be to be uh, his PR director to the shock of his mostly male friends. Uh, he turned from a from a narrow slim jeans into the more more politician look with a tie and stuff like that still he was getting third uh, and and only the first person gets 
elected. And then he started listening to the people. And then he understood that the people in San Francisco at the time were more concerned with the dog's poop than with the gay rights. And that must be shocking for him and really devastating for, for his friends. And it may sound devastating uh, to, to start with. But then he reframed his story. He says, okay, if this is what interests you, this is how we are going to play this game. Uh, I'm going to be your, your counselor that will curtail you of dog's poop. And uh, whether gay or not, I'm that person. And once he reframed the story, he got elected and raised the raised the raised the bar of the of the gay rights to the completely new level and made hundreds of thousands of people not only getting out of the closet but also getting getting uh, mobilized in so many different uh, ways of life. And I think the 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 but this is the decision we need to make. If this is the marathon, if we need a fellowship to to build through this marathon, mm. let's find the things we can agree upon, and then and then let's let's build it yeah. gradually, step by step. Yeah. So that's, and, that's and the principle the, of unity again that you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, right? It's so important. To, yeah, but it gets so difficult mm. in 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 polarized societies, mm. and and I think uh, America is no exception uh, to it. I I actually met the. This was really interesting in February. 2000, uh, 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 February 2017, I was doing my class. We do a lot of university classes and they look like workshops because the students come there with their cases and they're building the movement around the cases. So very much we treat students the same toolbox as we treat activists. And there were groups that were involved in a women's march and, and they wanted to work on a case on, you know, a women's equality in, a, in a gender equality in the U.S. And they were looking at what the smallest common denominator may be. And they told me this fantastic story that in the time of building of the event, uh, uh, the, 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 the women's march, there were a lot of different groups cooperating. And some of them are, are a kind of a, 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 from the same side of the spectrum. I mean, you could expect the women's rights groups, gay rights groups, racial rights groups, uh, 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 immigration groups, uh, green groups, and all of these groups. It's like they can easily come together. There was, a, there was supposedly a large chunk of, uh, of organizations of conservative women, which were also kind of wanting to come out and start working on more equality. But from what I'm hearing from my students, they were, they were, they were uh, de denied participation or they were denied the leadership role because they were pro-life. And now this is the very interesting thing. So if you really want to, to win this large battle, and 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 this is the large battle from you know raging all the way from you know equal pay to equal work to 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 bullying humiliating i mean it's like there is so much thing to be done in and from 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 paycheck through me too all the way into into abortion thing and if you decide that you are not going to align uh, with any group that 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 uh, uh, differs with you on one of these points you actually have just limited vote participation and diversity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So playing on your or or your identity politics, I hate this word. I'm Serbian. I'm always coming to US. They're always trying to explain to me how this creates your identity. I don't understand how your political stance creates your identity. I think the political stance is political stance. Identity is something uh, different than that. And also political stance is something that can be changed across the time. And you can you can be for this topic and then and then change your view. Uh, throughout the time, and you can you can be a, 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 a aggressive uh, capitalist when you were uh, younger, and then you can taste the capitalism and become a very lefty person, and then you can turn into the more conservative person till the end of your life. So I don't see how this is your identity, and how this this somehow the fact that you and me have different stance on a certain topic actually prevents us to cooperate on any other topic. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is very toxic, and this is very against any kind of, of healthy society mm -hmm. and more of that crap you have the more the more the more country reminds me on on where i started from which is one happy country falling apart on so many different uh, nationalism That's religious true. cultural lines and this is the recipe for disaster mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you don't need to try it home i can tell you that <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's true. Um, so in closing, Sergio, I want us to um, chat about um, a concert that took place in Belgrade in 2013 on the anniversary of Serbian revolution against Milosevic. Can you, can you describe what happened and why it was an important moment for you? 
Yeah, it was it was really interesting thing. And throughout my work, uh, uh, one of the one of the reasons why you should become activist if you're not one is because through activism you meet uh, amazing people, and and that's normal because the people ready to sacrifice their time and sometimes their their money and their freedom in many cases or their job uh, towards the higher cause are normally not usual people, but they're kind of thrilling. Well, throughout my work, I met some of my of my idols, and I can name some like Jim Lawson of the American Civil Rights Movement or, or, or Mario Vargas Llosa, one of my favorite uh, writers, a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And because they are all concerning human rights and they're all uh, moving in the same circles, and this is how I, how I got into my, my childhood idol, Pierre Gabriel, and then it appeared to be that we, we, we clicked on one and we spent like two hours talking and he was so thrilled to learn. He didn't know that he had such a big impact on the movement and that people were really aiming to it. At the time, he thought it's like, you know, making a South African struggle more international, but not really impacting the people's brain. And then it happened at the time when he was planning uh, his European tour and then he toured to Belgrade and then that it happened to be that he played in Belgrade with the anniversary of the Russian. This was absolutely random. This has nothing to do with planning. It was just, just the way the universe sometimes uh, wants things to play. And then, of course, he used that concert to to get on stage and, you know, pay honor to the Serbian revolution and how it inspired hundreds of thousands of people across the world. And here he is playing Biko and he raises his clenched fist and my childhood dreams comes true in my hometown at the age of 40 some. And uh, but this is this is amazing journey to which activism can guide you. And yes, one of the things that activism can do to you, it you can see your ideas or your friends' ideas or your movement's ideas play somewhere on the on the stage bigger that you could have imagined when you started the whole thing. And uh, there is no guarantee that this is going to happen, but when it happens, it really strikes you for life and gives a complete new meaning to your to your personal life. Yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine how you must have felt when, you know, at, at that concert, especially given um, the uh, story with your brother who um, made you listen to Biko write and then you realized that, uh, yes, this, this indeed is the purpose of music. And I've watched actually this concert on YouTube after reading your book and at the beginning, um, sorry, after, after that singing that, that song, he says, and now whatever happens here, it's up to you. Which again goes back to this message that anyone can create change. And I think it's very important, especially after a victory like that, to also continue in a way the fight. It's maybe not the fight anymore, but but one of the things that you also say is that it's really important to survive the victory. Um, right? Because there are some dangers to to consider that our work is done here and so we can go back to normal. I think the the it's a, it's a, another very important part of the toolbox is to understand that making change is one step making change permanent is completely another step and this also relates to all kind of different organizations and 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 businesses and I think making change per- permanent requires a completely different set of skills it requires patience it requires recruitment to the institution it requires studying the best cases it requires bringing up the world to help you and around half of the movements get it to the to the victory phase and around half of them fail after the victory and this is really weird statistics if you take a look at the statistics and and you say to somebody you know what if you start from 10 people it's very likely that you will build it somewhere to the 200,000 and then most likely once you win you're going to screw them it sounds like like abnormal, but this is exactly what it is. And surviving victory is difficult because A, you don't have the main driver, like the bad guy is not here, he stepped down. And B, uh, uh, the people lose interest and they want to go back to, or, to their normal life. So all of this glue, which was coming from the urge and grievance, is somehow out and people feel relief and they also feel they serve their terms, so they need to come back to their lives. So how do you also... Uh, changing laws and sitting in committees and coming out with solution is far less attractive and sexy than outrunning the police on the street with the tear gas. 
So these are all the challenges of a, of a transition phase, and you need to find a way to A, plan it for the transition phase, B, uh, work around the vision as opposed to right, work around this one step like the individual uh, is down. So how to make things done is one side of the story, but how to make things permanent is is a very important part of, of the story. And, and I think this also reflects another Another good good quote uh, that that you may be thinking of, which is where we are here. And it's like the the uh, Ronald Reagan wasn't my my favorite American president. Uh, I I didn't really believe in nuclear bombs and things of that kind. But he said one very interesting thing, and we are at, unfortunately witnessing the how these worlds are resonating with the world today. He said democracy is o- always only one generation far from extinction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is what we live now with erosion of democracy, with coming up of the populism, with the liberal democracy building, like in my neighborhood, Turkey, Hungary, mm-hmm. wherever you watch Poland, and uh, with, uh, with uh, huge attempts of authoritarians to undermine the very pillars of democracy, with Brexit, with growing uh, uh, growing uh, uh, destruction between the people and, uh, and the existing political elites. So we are living in a moment where even people in democracy should be waking up and yeah. uh, understanding that only because you guys are born in democracy, mm. you don't take it for granted. Absolutely. Because the healthy democracy is not only having a strong institutions, it is the people yeah. who are upholding this institution. Absolutely. And again, um, bringing it back to organizations and our listeners, clearly mo- most of our listeners are um, people uh, who work in, in companies, executives, team leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when, you know, an organization is doing really well, um, it doesn't, it it usually doesn't last long. So something disrupts them and then they really need to mobilize their people to make sure that not only they survive, but they also thrive. So I think it's really relevant to organizations as well. So one question, Sergey, if I can have just two minutes of your time, um, before we wrap it up, is if you had a really good friend who was, let's say, a CEO of a company and he wanted your advice on how he can mobilize his people to um, change the status quo because their industry was disrupted and they need to change and they need to start operating differently and the old recipe for success is not working anymore, right? Right. What would you advise him to do? If you only had two minutes chatting with him over coffee or beer, what would you tell him? Well, first of all, uh, in movements and business, every crisis is the opportunity. It just depends on how you approach it. And it's the opportunity to shake up the organization. It's the opportunity to set up the new goals. And I think you need to take a lead and, and share it with the people. I also need think that you need to find a way to get the people's ideas on how the problem is solved instead of just telling them, oh, this is the crisis. Now we need to shift from A to B and this is what you guys are going to do because then they're unlikely there. You're shaking their comfortable life or some vague idea instead of bringing them on the table and say, okay, this is the bomb. And this is where the bomb came in, and this is the crisis, and how do we manage the crisis? And and in the movements, uh, it's it's very good to have uh, some decisions which are brought centrally, and some decisions which are delegated to the branches. And I think the the successful movements know how to decentralize, and not only to decentralize in a physical space, but also decentralize and delegate the decision making process, because the more creative people you involve, the more you are likely to find the creative solutions. So I would go with a with a similar advice that I have for movements. If the if the crisis is moving your way, you need to make one step forward, and you need to embrace the crisis and say, okay, this is how the reality is going to look in the next year or two. Uh, we're going to have NATO bombing. So what do we do when we have a movement against the government and at the same time we have a supposed uh, allies that are killing our people? So how do we do this? And then you go with a little brainstorming, and then whatever decision is kind of homegrown and comes from the organization. And because there is this wide debate within the organization, then the people are more likely to follow it because they they are also the shareholders of the idea or the shareholders of the new plan or the shareholders of the new market strategy, however you want to name it. So 
going one step ahead and figuring out how to make it a discussion point on various levels of your organization as opposed as you know sticking to the board and sticking to the top bottom change because the top bottom change especially in the big organization uh, can can be can be faced with a how do you call this inertia from the system the larger the organization the more it's difficult to shift its its like it's one thing if you want to move a kid's a flow, flow, floatable boat, which has like 200 kilos. So you just push it on a wall, and now you push it from one side to another. Yeah. It's not a thing if this is a tanker, right. which has yeah. tens of thousands of tons and is yeah. already traveling from place A to place mm-hmm. B. The larger the organization, the more engagement you need from a, from a grassroots mm-hmm. level to really shift it, as opposed to just, mm-hmm. you know, pressing the button and now yeah. the shift will move. Yeah. And it might sound a little bit counterintuitive to our listeners um, because normally you you see the opposite happening. So the larger the organization, the it 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 tends to be more centralized, or at least this was that tendency up until now. And now I think a lot of organizations are trying to decentralize for exactly the reasons that you have mentioned. Um, so what would be the final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, basically, uh, read the book. Uh, I think you're going to have fun. It's very readable. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Second thing is uh, don't think that because you're coming from a company or organizational environment, these rules don't apply. Take a look at these rules and try to apply them uh, in your organization and maybe you'll have uh, amazing results. And then however good money you earn, and you can always donate a part of this money to (laughs) to us, uh, you want to take a look at the real change Mm -hmm. and you want to take a look at, okay, this is my little happy world, but Am I really happy? Would, wouldn't I be a little bit more happier if I somehow contribute to my own community, mm-hmm. to my own society? Because, uh, you know, it's not being an activist. It's not uh, black and white. You can be successful in whatever you are doing. But also if you share a little bit of your time and an energy and a talent contributing in, a, in, a, in a, a game changer in your society, that will make your life so much more interesting and that will expose you to the very interesting people. And at the end of the day, when you go to sleep, you'll have a better sleep. Yeah. I love that. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate sharing your experiences. And I definitely encourage all our listeners to read your book. It's fantastic. And actually, Sergio, I'm going to experiment and use some of these principles with the the organizations I work with. So I'm very happy to reach uh, out to you and tell you how how that's going on the inside of the organizations as well. Please do. I will. I will. Um, one last thing that I want to ask you is whether you have any recommendations as far as uh, the next guests on the podcast are concerned. Do you do you have someone who you believe I should be talking to who has something interesting to say about culture or change or um, leadership? Well, I don't know the people who are running it, but I think the the one of the like when you when you talk contemporary movements like you can take a look at Greta Thunberg type of this high school uh, very international Friday climate change march I mean in the term of mobilization especially the mobilization of the young people they seem to be they seem to be most promising and I don't know how the how the how the how this thing uh, shifts and I don't know who runs it and I know how it is run but it seems to be spreading and and it seems to be pretty effective in mobilizing the most important part of of society so I think this looking at these young people and how you mobilize these these millennials or even generation Z around something very very big and very important but also very vague as a as a climate change is something that really interests me and how do you build how do you build this generational like like normally this is the this is output 2.0 so how does how do you mobilize sky cool sky cool uh, sky school uh, things yeah. to get not to get distracted with dates not to spend their time on instagram but really doing something in the real world for the planet it is a challenge isn't it yeah, and definitely we can learn a lot from them. So um yeah, thank you for thank you for this idea. I'm definitely going to reach out um and ask for an interview. Thank you very, very much. We're going to uh, post the link to your book in the show notes for all the listeners who want to check it out. And if people want to learn more about the work that you do or about you personally, where should they go? Uh, www.canvasopedia.org is our website. We have several really cool uh, free tools like 
50 crucial points in nonviolent struggle. It's a free PDF. Then our whole core curriculum is also downloadable for free, like what we teach groups, mm -hmm. the course. And then there is a page which may be very interesting for, for, for your listeners, which is called How to Build a Movement Under 45 Minutes. <laughs> Point oh, yes. on so 10, 10 short animated videos yeah. which are covering the concepts that we just explained. Mm -hmm. And it's basically made for, for that's kind of a revolution for dummies. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I actually haven't have seen it yet so i'm i'm really curious to um check it out myself thanks for thanks Good. for directing us to it thank you so much again uh it was such a pleasure speaking to you and i hope that we can have you back at some time in the future and maybe we can chat about how we've been implementing the principles inside the organizations and what we'll i would be that. i would be super <laughs> curious to learn about that and then good luck in that work thank you thank you very much thank you for inviting me I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast, and this is the Culture Lab team. Production manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art director, Emily Spencer. Aaron Scott, content editor. Sound producer, James Ede, Be Heard. If you haven't subscribed to the Culture Lab yet, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many other places where podcasts are available. If you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, The Culture Lab Insider, go to www.agabayer.com slash podcast and scroll down to the very bottom of the page. That's www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. And now, as usual, I want to give you a preview of my next interview. Leanne Davy is the New York Times bestselling author of You First, Inspire Your Team to Grow Up, Get Along and Get Stuff Done. She's also a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review and an organizational psychology expert for Quartz Magazine. As the co-founder of 3COZE, she advises on business strategy and executive team effectiveness, and she's worked with a lot of huge companies like Amazon, Walmart, TD Bank, 3M, and so on and so forth. She has a PhD in organizational psychology, and her new book, The Good Fight, Use Productive Conflict to Get Your Team and Your Organization Back on Track, was released in March 2019. In this short preview, Leanne talks about something that I found really liberating and empowering. The difference between being nice and being kind. I also found her definition of candor very, very useful. Have a listen. One of the things that I think is interesting and different between nice and kind is nice is easy for us usually, fairly easily. We can paste on a false smile and we can say something nice. Being kind takes candor often. And so I've just created my own definition of candor uh, to help people think about this kindness. So candor for me is my willingness to be uncomfortable for your benefit. And that's a kind person, a person who is willing to be uncomfortable for someone else's benefit. And so nice is easy. Kind sometimes requires candor, sometimes requires discomfort, but those are the people for whom we hold out the greatest trust, the greatest respect, the greatest love, is people who are willing to be uncomfortable for our benefit. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lab. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>